Well, welcome everybody and uh, happy snowy November Wednesday to uh, everyone joining us now. Um, come on in. We're looking forward to uh, to people joining us today. Our topic today is uh, gender lens investing. And my guest today, I'm really excited to have Kelly Baldoni. Kelly is the head of global women, women's strategies at Impacts Asset Management. And um, we've been using the Impacts Global Women's Leadership Fund for a number of years now. And, and I'm really excited to have Kelly come um, share with us some of the strategies that Impacts is using and how um, this fund in particular is, um, is helping investors um, achieve some goals around gender lens investing. A little bit of background, Kelly, you've been, you've been at Impacts, I believe, for a few years, since, 19, since uh, 2014, I think, is right? Yes, 2014. And looks like you went to um, Trinity College, and you also are, are a graduate of uh, Wharton's uh, Women's Executive Leadership Program. So congratulations, and we're happy to have you have you here today. Thanks, Michael. I'm thrilled to uh, speak on my favorite topic with everybody today. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I wanted to start off, Kelly, by telling us a little bit about um, about the firm, about impacts. Um, and then um, I'm very curious and want people to hear about the history of the fund in particular. But tell us about the company. What, what's the company all about? Where is it based? And and um, what, what's the history there? Yeah, so... Um... Hi, everybody. Um, thanks again for, for joining and inviting me, Michael. I work at a firm that is fully de dedicated to sustainable investing. Um, so Impacts Asset Management is headquartered in the UK, actually in London. Our US headquarters is in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and we have offices kind of spread throughout the globe. Um, but we, yeah, we focus 100% on sustainable investing and we are firm believers that our economy is in transition to a more sustainable one. And as investment managers, we're looking at that in terms of there's going to be risks and opportunities associated with that transition and just kind of global sustainability challenges for companies. Um, and we want to take advantage of those. And so across all of our products, we're looking at environmental, social, and governance issues, in addition to the fundamental analysis that you'd get um, with any investment manager. One of the one of the things we we really like um, about working with Impacts is the history and the and the full on commitment to sustainability, but also the the Women's Leadership Fund in particular. And I'm going to ask you to really dig into that. One of the things we really like about that fund is it follows a lot of our philosophy too around not only sustainability but around index investing and mm -hmm. really applying um, the academic research. To um, to investing outcomes, investing allocation, um, taking taking factors into account, and things like that. Um, you guys have got a, a solid history, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, if not the first one of the early um, uh, funds specifically focused on uh, with a gender lens. So maybe walk us through that. Tell us about the history of the fund. How did it get started? I think it's got a really interesting history. Yeah, sure. And you're right, Michael, we were the first. Um, our firm, too, actually was, was formerly Pax World Funds. So people might yeah. be familiar with that. Impacts purchased Pax World um, maybe around four years ago. But we actually had the first ever socially responsible fund like 50 years ago. The, the, it was a balanced fund that we still have today. So we've been, um, you know, 50 years, long time investors in this space. Um, but we were definitely the pioneering uh, leaders for gender lens investing. Uh, our president, Joe Keith, came on board in 2006, I believe, and one of his kind of like first orders of business was bringing in-house a gender equality fund. Um, it was managed by a woman out in California. He had heard of it and just had immediate high conviction in gender equity and gender equality as an investment concept. So we brought that fund in-house. It dates back to like the early 90s. Um, in 2007. So it's been well over a decade that our team has been um, applying a gender lens to an investment product and we've been offering one. Um, but I came on board in 2014, a month before we launched our current strategy, which is called the PAX Elevate Global Women's Leadership Fund. Um, so we've evolved our gender lens strategies over time. Um, but 
where the fund kind of you know started in 2014 and stands today is, is pretty much the same, which is that it's a systematic um, investment approach or kind of a quantitative investment approach. And I could get into the details of that, but you know we started in partnership with uh, Sally Krawcheck. Some of you guys might be familiar with her. She's like a Wall Street legend. Um, she formerly ran Merrill Lynch. She ran Citibank. Um, and she was looking to get into the gender lens space and, and found us and said, you know, you guys are already here and have this great product. I want to partner with you. So that was the, the start of the Pax Elevate Fund. Um, and yeah, we just came together to say, hey, first, let's create an index of yeah. the highest rated companies in the world as it relates to gender uh, leadership and diversity. Um, so that was kind of our first order of business. And so we, we launched a Global Women's Leadership Index. And then from there, we launched the Pax Elevate Fund in, in the same year. But we were the first to market with a, with a strategy like this, uh, with an index. And now we have, you know, eight plus years of running a live strategy. Um, you know, that has this, uh, this kind of approach. And we're not the only ones now, which Michael, I'm happy about, because it just means, you know, this is a really strong concept. There's over 24 public equity funds now that have globally, that have a gender lens approach. And we're thrilled to see like that this investment concept is, is gaining more traction um, broadly, because we, we still, from day one to now, have this high conviction in the space. Yeah. So Kelly, I want to dig into that a little bit more, but but a couple of housekeeping items that I forgot in the beginning. So uh -oh. so I apologize, everybody. I want to let you know that this uh, session is being recorded. We posted on our website um, about a week later. So so close, sometime close to the end of next week, we'll have this posted on our website, which is um, uh, a link to our our um, Copperleaf YouTube channel. And I want to encourage questions. We always encourage questions. If you have questions for Kelly or for me um, along the way, please enter your questions in the in the chat box or in the Q&A, and we'll pick those up um, as we go. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the basic concept of gender lens investing. And, and what does that mean? I mean, I think I, I kind of get it. And if I put myself in the place of um, an investor or a consumer that that had no experience, I might have an idea. But yeah. what is exactly does that that mean? What do we mean by what do you guys mean by gender lens investing? Yeah. And if you're sitting there having no idea, that's very normal. <laughs> I talk about this all over um, the country and even into Canada. And it's very popular that someone goes, what is that, Kelly? Um, so you're not alone. But, you know, gender lens investing, and Michael and I were actually just talking about this before the call, it, it's very broad, and it can mean a lot of different things to different people, and it can and look in different ways. Um, you know, kind of what we're typically seeing, um, and when investors are talking about aligning their investments with a gender lens or, or looking to incorporate one, often it's looking at, you know, women's access to capital, um, especially women entrepreneurs, um, where is VC dollars going? Often it can look at um, investing in companies that have products that specifically benefit the lives of women and girls. Um, and then, you know, for us, what we're doing is we're looking at public companies and we're trying to identify the highest rated companies that we can uh, globally that have the best uh, diverse leadership teams. So, board of directors, executive management, C-suite, um, who are the decision makers and are those groups diverse? Um, and then what kind of workplace policies are in place to promote um, equity and inclusion uh, throughout the organization? Um, so we wanna see it not just from the top, but also kind of throughout the organization that they value the role of, of diversity um, in the talent pipeline all the way up to the leadership team. So that's the gender lens that we're taking in the public um, equity space. And and so what I'm hearing is you're you're applying screens to identify those companies that that score maybe at a certain level in terms of their kind of their current experience around gender equity, whether it's in the in the executive suite or on the board or or mm -hmm. within the organ organization in general. 
What about influencing companies moving forward? Are you guys um, taking an active role in trying to influence companies in in the direction of of greater gender equity? Yeah, we definitely do. We're very active investors um, in terms of our shareholder engagement. You know, we think of engagement as a stewardship. It's a dialogue. It's a partnership with the companies that we own across all of the funds that we have, not just the Pax Elevate Fund. Um, but it's a really powerful tool that we have to use to influence companies and move the needle on issues like board diversity, um, workplace practices and policies around equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, including pay equity is a big topic that we talk to companies about. So we've had a fair amount of success. Um, last year, we undertook just over 200 company engagements, 47% um, of which had positive outcomes. And 13% of those were pretty confident in the fact that impacts as engagement was a, a large driver of, of that result. So often it's a collective effort of investors and shareholder pressure. Um, and we're happy to partner and, and make it happen all together. Um, but yeah, we're, we're incredibly active. Um, and we've seen kind of the, the progression of companies like willing to change, uh, advance more quickly in the last two years than probably in the last 10 before. You know, it was, it was hard to get companies to change. And I think with just like the transparency that we see today and how important reputation is um, to the bottom line of a company, Mm -hmm. we're not getting, you know, the phone hung up on us when we're calling to talk about pay equity. We're saying if they're not doing it, um, we're saying we know we need to. How, how would you go about doing that? You know, do you have best practices for us? It's definitely on our priority list. Like it's it's a much richer conversation today um, than it was. So that's been exciting to see. And I bet I and, and I wonder, actually, um, to what degree are you are you guys finding that? The reporting and the data is actually there. I mean, our, 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 I imagine I picture a world, you know, years ago, I don't know how many years ago, that may not have even reported um, gender pay gap or, or kind of what the, um, what the pay looked like from a gender perspective across the company. Are you finding that more companies are reporting that data? And uh, what, what are you guys seeing from that, from the data perspective? Definitely. Data in the sustainable investing world is always the biggest challenge mm -hmm. um, for us and, and definitely around um, demographic data, which is you know, obviously what, what we're looking at. So, you know, finding gender, um, you know, on, on the board is, is somewhat easy. Um, even the management team is getting a little bit more challenging um, here in the US, but, you know, globally in some you know, places it's illegal to ask, you know, certain privacy related questions, um, right. including demographic data to their employees. So um, data is definitely a challenge um, just on the leadership level. I'm just going to be like who makes up your company, um, especially going beyond gender to other dimensions of diversity. Um, we're hoping to get there, but it's definitely a challenge. It, it, the progress is being made slowly but surely um, on initiatives like pay equity and then some of the other Kind of criteria that we're looking at, which is, is a company setting diversity targets and goals? Um, do they have a diverse talent pipeline kind of in place? And are they disclosing their gender related um, uh, employee demographic data? So those are kind of like the four things that, that we're looking at in addition to the leadership levels. And I would say it's about half of the companies in our fund. So we own about 400 companies um, in our fund out of a universe of 1,600. About half report on pay equity, um, whereas the average of those 1,600 is about 30%. Um, yeah, yeah I would, the, the, the most disclosure right now is in employee demographic data. We have about almost 90% of the companies we own disclose that, 70% in the... Um, is like the global average. Um, and then the diversity targets too, that one's just around the same as pay equity. So when we're looking to see a company say, you know, by 2030, we wanna have 50% of our manage, mid-level managers women, something like that, those kind of targets, goal setting. It's about 48% of the companies in our fund have publicly disclosed those goals um, versus 38% in, um, the MSCI world, which is our, our universe and global average. 
Yeah. Well, congratulations on on the good work. It's it's uh, it's not easy. Clearly, not easy. But you know, it's going to take you know f- consumers and um, you know the dollars speak. And and in the fund right now, if I'm not mistaken, well, well how many dollars are invested? Because I'm probably looking at some old data. How much does the fund represent overall in terms of dollars and cents, investor dollars? <laughs> Um, because I, I bet that's meaningful when you when you go to companies and say we represent, you know, X amount of investor dollars. That's that can have an impact. What what what's the size of the fund right now? It's about seven hundred and sixty million. Okay, so that's pretty meaningful. Not getting close to a billion, but uh, but not there. We right were now. over a billion, Michael, at one point last year. Know. You know, we all know how the markets have been treating us lately. So we yeah. we did hit a billion, and it was a huge milestone for us. Like when I joined. I kid you not, I, I wasn't sure we'd get to 100 million. Um, it was just, you know, this concept was one that people, you know, initially weren't totally open to hearing about, like, what is gender lens investing? Like, I'm a serious investor, Kelly, I want to make money, right? And so, you know, what I spent the first five years doing in my career is, you know, here at Impacts was talking about the business case. And I'm, and I'm happy to kind of share a little bit about that, but it was really this business case that links diverse leadership teams at companies with better performance and it's there and it's robust and we can talk about it all day long. And that's what is what really got us to that billion now 760 um, number. It wasn't, you know, people just wanting to, um, you know, be nice. It was convincing them that this was a really smart investment concept and Hey, guess what? It could have a positive impact on the world too. Yeah, I, I do want to hear more about that and, and, and want to ask you to, to explore that a little bit. We're getting some questions and thanks thanks for uh, posting your questions. Um, I'll go ahead and launch into one and then um, I want to get back to that. And also, I bet you have some stories you might be able to share about specific companies and some of the impact or some of the behaviors there. But so here's a question, um, a good question. Uh, uh, they said, I heard you talk about gender equity as it relates to women. Can you sp- Can you speak to how non-binary or transgender equity is is supported in the fund is that a consideration or what's your what's your kind of your your view on that right now so that kind of goes to the data point we were just talking about um yep. you know that kind of information is incredibly challenging to get just because it's obviously not required disclosure Mm-hmm. Um, some some companies aren't even asking for it. Some are, but it's obviously voluntary to to report on. Um, I think we're getting better. We're seeing it, but for us as managers, that you know, in a systematic way, are evaluating companies on a variety of factors. That isn't one of the factors right now. Just I, I think right now we just wouldn't have enough data to to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, but where we are trying to to focus on it is in that engagement effort. Um, just, you know, all of our uh, engagement around pay equity, diversity and inclusion, the workplace policies um, is not just about women, getting women equality. It's, um, you know, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, women, you know, gender, transgender, binary, like it's all inclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where we're trying to move the needle. Time will tell if it's information that we can actually get as investors to apply, you know, to our process. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know in, in all areas of sustainability, like you said, the, the, we've made huge progress, but that data is really the, really the challenge, but um, I don't want to be negative about it because like we work with this one company that's um, like a Nordic company, it's called Equileap. And, you know, we do a lot of our own data collection ourselves. We have for years, um, but they are a company that's fully running on, build you know kind of getting at all of this information i think they're collecting like 19 different gender related factors um at thousands of public companies all over the world and then you can buy that data and research so we do a lot of other companies you know gender lens funds do as well um, to get as full of a picture as we can so i think companies like equileap that can continue to push on companies because that's their like sole mission Mm -hmm. um, to get more data will be really influential Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any stories you can tell about some of the, the uh, companies that you guys own shares in and um, maybe some of the progress that's been made or, or tell, tell us about if you've got any, maybe you don't have any, but any stories you can share? Yeah, um, 
Well, first I could give you kind of like a picture of some of the companies that are in the fund. Cause uh, yeah. another question I get is like, Kelly, a women's leadership fund, like what kind of companies are these and picturing like pink logos and stuff, but you know, it's these big blue chip, high quality names, you know, that, that are, starting universe is and that we're we're selecting from um mm-hmm. and maybe i'll just back up so you know our selection process mm-hmm. we as i mentioned are looking at the leadership levels and those other kind of workplace policies once we collect all that data on 1600 companies in the msci world we then score them essentially 1 to 1600 on our impact gender score um according to that score we then invest in the top 25% which is about the top 400 names. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, and these are all, you know, bigger size companies. So Microsoft is, you know, and um, like Apple and American Waterworks and big companies are the, the ones that we're invested in. Um, an example of one that I really like right now is Etsy. And I think that's for a few reasons. Um, so of course, they have the diverse leadership angle, because that's how they've kind of made it into our fund. So women comprise 44% of their board of directors, um, about half of their board self-identify um, with additional dimensions of diversity. So not a reason that we're including it, but very good to see and what we, we want to see. And we know that there is a link between when more women are in, in leadership, there's greater levels of other kinds of diversity as well. Um, and they also achieved gender parity on their executive management teams. Um, I think that was last year and their CFO is a woman. Um, so leadership looks really good at Etsy. Um, but then within the workplace, I really like to see kind of like what's going on there that they're doing well. And um, last year they started this mentorship circle program where they're engineering sponsorship programs for women and underrepresented minority engineers. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just launches kind of company-wide ed and program learning platform um, that's been really successful. Um, they've also done a pay equity analysis, super important um, for us to see. And it's also a, a real signal of a of an alpha generator too. When mm-hmm. companies have pay equity, we see their performance mm-hmm. increase. Um, so yeah, they, they conducted a pay equity analysis in 2020 with the help of a third party outside consultant and found that there was no unexplained pay gaps um, to women or employees from other uh, marginalized genders or non-white employees. So that was great. And then proactively, we're seeing um, them set those diversity goals and targets You know, we kind of talked about um, and really focusing on its supply chain and, and marketplace. And you know, generally, as we know, I think we all might use Etsy. I know I use Etsy all the time. I mean, it's women entrepreneurs, like by and large, right, mm-hmm. um, with their own businesses. So that's one company that we're really kind of proud to own. Um, on the engagement front, yeah, Walt Disney um, is a company that, you know, think about how diverse their employee base must be from like, you know, the senior executives to the park employees. Um, mm-hmm. Like, how do you do pay equity assessment on, on a company like, like yeah. Walt Disney? Um, and just, you know, geographically where it is. So that's been a really interesting conversation that our team at Impacts um, has had over, I think, a few years. So our latest engagement, the dialogue centered on human capital efforts and oversights and ed and efforts um, and just kind of what disclosures. Um, we, we wanted to see more disclosures. So the company... Um, as a result of, of our dialogue and, and other kind of probably shareholder pressure disclosed its EEO one report, which is around employee demographic data. Um, and it reported the, the workplace equity um, to its board of directors and its compensation committee in 2021. So mm-hmm. essentially saying like, they knew that there was probably some pay gaps um, unexplained to to be closed at a, at a company like that. It's not a surprise. No company is perfect. And we're not, you know, trying to make company, you know, call companies out. We want to work with them. As I said, we want to partner with them. So this was a really great one to just say, of course, there's probably going to be some complexities around your pay equity mm-hmm. um, at a company of your size and with that diverse of a workforce. Um, how can we help? And, and we were really excited to see that they wanted to uh, do better than they did this kind of um, formal oversight of their workplace equity and then disclose the results too. 
And, you know, what I love about that is if, if it weren't for you guys and partnering with other, with other organizations to bring this question, you know, maybe they would have dealt with it. Maybe they would have gotten to reporting from, you know, some pressure from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, congratulations for doing that work. I think as, as an investor and, and working with our clients and investors, I think that's the kind of result that people are looking for is, yeah. you know, wh what are my dollars supporting in terms of making a chain, making changes and moving the needle um, towards greater gender equity? And, and that, you know, maybe that sounds like a small step, but yeah, you're right. That's a huge organization. And for them to to gather and report that data, that's that's su a surprisingly big step, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's not always successful, to be honest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We do engagements um, and we, we kind of consider them to be multi-year, right? We don't expect a company to change overnight. It's a very long process. But when they do change, right, it's really impactful to your point, Michael. But, you know, Oracle is an example where we had engagement with them for years on pay equity and we were mm -hmm. not successful. Mm -hmm. you know so or and, not yet. and and so what happened did you keep them did you stay remain invested in, in the company or what what was the result of that not in the pax elevate fund um yeah. i don't i'd have to check on if we own them in our large cap fund or another product i'm gonna say i don't think so but don't quote me on that um yeah, like, you know, we were engaging with them on pay equity because they were a little bit notorious for having issues um, on that front. And this was three, four years, I want to say, that we were, you know, heavily, um, you know, filing shareholder uh, proposals. Our, our lead on this, Heather Smith, my colleague, is awesome. And, and she was going to California and going to the shareholder meetings and standing in front of the board and reading what we wanted to happen. And it was increasingly getting the outside shareholder vote. Um, but I think, you know, Larry Ellison and other uh, senior people there own so much of the company that um, it did not win. We, we were not able to win um, that. But again, it's, it's still important, obviously, to engage. And we were, we've been talking about it and telling our shareholders, like, here, this is where it's not, you know, the needle's not getting moved at this company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's other tech giants like Apple and Amazon and Salesforce, we have had successful engagements there on pay equity, you know, so they're kind of like the outliers. We usually like to start with the behemoths and hope there's a trickle down effect mm -hmm. that if, you know, um, Apple is, is talking about pay equity, it's going to create some kind of standard, right? Yeah. So let's get back to the, that business case. So what is the business case for um, for companies doing better for for um, for gender equity, T tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so as I said, there is there's a, a mountain of research, um, you know, from Harvard, McKinsey, Credit Suisse, um, you know, both the financial and academic kind of uh, research that has looked at company performance as it relates to diversity on the board of directors and senior management. And, and hold on, hold, pause for a second. When you mm -hmm. say company performance, do you mean um, profitability on the company level? Or are you talking about the performance of the of the stock or the shares? What do you mean by company performance? Michael, it can really be all of it, um, it depending on the report. Um, they've been mm -hmm. linking both the quantitative and the qualitative. So, mm -hmm. you know, the share price, certainly, um, you know, but also like lower risk and, and kind of lower volatility metrics. Um, right. Uh, return on equity, return on invested capital. So there's been a lot of the kind of quantitative financials. Um, but then there's also been that qualitative business case where they're saying um, when you have more diversity, you have greater long-term focus, greater client focus. Um, these companies are more resilient. That was a really interesting um, kind of link during the pandemic specifically to see how companies were kind of weathering that storm. And there's a data that was showing companies that had the diverse perspective at the top, no surprise to us, right? We kind of all, I, I bet Michael's nodding his head. I bet others are too. Yeah. Like it makes sense, right? It, it makes sense, makes yeah. Sense. <laughs> I would um, expect that. Right. And like, you know, these companies also have stronger cultures and they're more innovative and, um, but, but it's backed by data. You know, I always say it's like evidence-based. It's backed by data. This isn't just us sitting around thinking like, this sounds good. This sounds smart, Right. Um, so what brought us to the table as investors was really studying this business case and saying, this is, if this is true, which we believe it to be, right, this is going to be a driver of alpha, 
And that's mm-hmm. what we're trying to do at an investment firm, right? We want strong returns for our, our clients. Um, so, you know, kind of how it fit into, I would say, our investment philosophy at Impacts is, I mentioned we feel that we're in this transition to a more sustainable, more kind of global economy, but we think that gender equality is going to be a key driver in that transition. And so on the risks and kind of opportunities, if you're looking at investments that way, as it relates to gender equality, you know, we believe, and with, again, what the research is kind of backing us up and telling us is that companies that, um, you know, utilize the entire talents of their workforce, that have women well represented in leadership, that close gender pay gaps, those companies stand to benefit. Um, And conversely, uh, the companies that are not proactively embracing diversity and equality and their culture ignores things like discrimination and and harassment, um, you know, those companies are putting themselves at a clear disadvantage that is affecting the performance, the share price, et cetera, those examples we just gave, um, and, and, you know, overall morale can suffer, productivity can suffer, you lose employees, and, and we can kind of talk about the state of even women at work and the workplace in general, everybody's moving around right now, the great resignation that, you know, we are all kind of hearing about and talking about, you know, if your employees are not happy, if, if employee satisfaction is not high, that's a really critical, in, in our opinion, um, thing to pay attention to as an investment manager. Those are, these are signals of trouble coming or opportunities um, that companies doing well and are well positioned. So that's that's kind of like the thinking in the business case. And we have a paper that's called the business case for diversity. So if anybody wants to dig into like the numbers and the data um, around specific reporting, we summarize it in a, in a paper and I could share it with Michael after this. Um, but, but that's really what brought us to the table as investors to say, if this is true, why wouldn't we use this lens Mm-hmm. to then separate out these companies that have the greatest levels of diverse leadership from the ones that don't. And let's see how that performs. So that was the, the fundamental kind of basis for the PAX Elevate strategy. Um, and it's been really competitive. You know, we've been, we've been happy with how the fund has performed um, over the long time. And we've been really excited to kind of prove this investment thesis out in, in real time with real, you know, money behind it. Um, and we hope, you know, it, it's continues in this direction. Unfortunately, it looks like we might be heading into a, a downturn or a recession. And I've been talking about this the last few weeks, like now is definitely the time you'd want to pay attention to this, right? Mm-hmm. Now is mm-hmm. definitely the time that this, this research telling us diverse teams make better decisions or have greater long-term focus, weather storms, better lower volatility. Now, you know, now is definitely the time we want that. And I think you know, we're not saying women make better decisions than men. That is definitely not the business case and what the research is saying. It's diverse groups make better decisions than homogeneous ones. Um, so I always think that's important to put out. Like, I know it's called the Global Women's Leadership Fund, um, you know, but we wouldn't want to invest in a company that's all women either, because that's that's not what the data tells us. Mm-hmm. That's a, such a great point. And it, and it reminds me that for our clients, when we're working with our clients, um, you know, from a from a planning perspective, and we're helping clients construct an investment policy that's aligned with their goals, and we're helping to make sure that that our clients' money is also aligned with their values. That's an important consideration. But then, one of the reasons we like using this fund in part of the the, the sustainable portfolio is that it's not only taking into account the the values alignment, but it's also um, we believe a smart investment for the future because of the things that you talked about. It's really a matter of risk management. Um, and you know our our thesis about the future is that um, those companies that are that are more diverse, that are that are they're they're doing more positive things for um, on an ESG basis, a kind of across the across the spectrum, are more likely to perform better in the future. Um, more likely to attract investor dollars and and more likely to um, produce products that that people want want to buy and and consume. So and so far that that thesis has turned out to be to be um, pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, so thanks for thanks for talking about that. Um, you, you know, you 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 mentioned um, COVID. You mentioned the the pandemic. Um, 
What impact has has COVID had on on um, on this space? And uh, not not so much the fund, maybe the fund, but have you seen any impact of of COVID? And kind of what's your thought? What are your thoughts about that? If any, maybe not. Enormous, enormous impact on what we're doing and what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and not a positive one, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, th I think there's some good things that have, that have come out of the pandemic, like more flexible work and things like that in a lot of places. But, um, you know, unfortunately, it's set women back um, in terms of, of progress towards leadership um, in the workplace. And there's an amazing report that we cite all the time um, in our work. It's from McKinsey. It's called Women in the Workplace. It's an annual report. Um, mm -hmm. The latest one just came out like two weeks ago, I want to say, and they look at something like 600 companies and it's over 20 million employees that they're kind of surveying, collecting data on in the US. Um, and some of the key findings, you know, I'll share with you that, that, that aren't great, but this is why we need, you know, gender lens investing to, to help uh, turn this around. Um, but COVID has just set us back enormously, you know, during the pandemic, and I had a baby like the first week of the pandemic. And so I felt like personally, I was really understanding, um, you know, a lot of what the data was was kind of telling us of just the pressure that, you know, women had, um, often women, sometimes men, but mostly women to, you know, downshift their careers or leave the workforce when schools were not opening. Mm -hmm. A million people in September of 2022, a million women left the workforce. Wow. One month. Um, obviously coinciding with return to school or sorry, 2020. So, you know, and that's just kind of, there's been a trickle down effect. So what this woman in the workplace report says, definitely look it up. There's a great summary if you're interested in this. Um, in, in the past year, just looking at last year, women leaders have switched jobs at the highest rates that we've ever seen, um, higher than men in leadership. And when we're thinking about why that was, um, I think it's directly as a result of COVID where women just started to kind of say like, they're not going to tolerate certain things. Like, you know, the, the patient's level came down. Like if they are going to be working, if they're going to leave their families, if they're going to go to, you know, like really in this, um, trying to rise through the ranks, if they're not the right company, that company's not supporting them to do that. They're leaving, they're gone. That's mm -hmm. what, that's what we've seen. Um, you know, unfortunately women are still, drastically underrepresented. It's one in four women in the C-suites, um, executive women. Um, it's only one in 20 women of color. Mm. Um, so this, they, they coined this term, the broken first rung, which um, in this report, which is referring to that first promotion to manager um, mm. for every hundred men promoted. And that, that first kind of entry level to manager, only 87% of women are 87 women for 100 men, 87 women yeah. are promoted and it's 82 wow. women of color um, are promoted. And mm -hmm. so compound that year over year over year, by the time you get to the C-suite, you know, they're saying, where's all the women? We'd love to yeah. have a woman in, in the C-suite. We can't find any, what's happening? Yeah. So right. they term it this broken first rung. It's like a great kind of thing to, to dive into. But yeah, I mean, I think I think companies are, are at a, a point that they can, prioritize the, the human capital management um, mm -hmm. to retain their best talent because um, we know how costly it is to companies when people leave um, to replace that employee it does it's it's much more expensive and damaging than you know training that employee or, or promoting that employee or, or paying that employee fairly or whatever the issue is that they might have left um, so I think that's that's a real opportunities that companies have right now and again as investors a signal um, to us mm -hmm. is companies we, we would want to invest in because right now the landscape is we're going backwards in terms of representation post COVID. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to take something like 135 years, according to the, the wow. world economic forum until we get to parity. I know I don't want to be depressing like today, everybody, but you know, it's, and that number has gone up because I've been reporting on that number for like five years now. So mm -hmm. 135 years, just till we get to parity. Wow. Um, you know, so it's like the glass ceiling is still there. It's still alive and well. I'm a, I'm a millennial and my friends are like, Kelly, what do you mean? Like I'm rising quickly through my career. Like I'm better than all the guys. Like, this is fine. Like, I don't get what you're saying. And then we enter like the thirties and forties and we're having kids and we're taking these like career breaks and things start to happen. And then all of a sudden it's like, 
you know, this, this company doesn't support me. Like, you know, life is, is getting challenging. Do I even really want to like still stick it out? I'm not rising or, you know, whatever. Like that's, that's why we're in the situation that we're in. Oh. Um, it's very, it's, it's very clear. So it's going to take a lot of pressure on companies as investors, as employees, as, you know, just humans in society to like, just turn this around. Yeah. Um, which, which leads me to wonder where's the, where's the fund going and what, what are you guys doing from, a um, kind of an innovation standpoint or, or what, what kind of projects do you have? Are you, are you thinking about, um, to help continue to, to move the needle on this stuff or, or, or are you, or, you know, is, or, yeah. And, and one of the things I wonder about is something you mentioned before, which I, I didn't really ask you to explore, but this idea of partnership that, that you guys are, are working with other organizations and things like that. And maybe that factors into it. I don't know. But what's 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 the what's your crystal ball say or what's the horizon look like in terms of projects and, and where you guys are headed? Yeah, I can answer that kind of from like the funds perspective. And then there's a new engagement campaign that I'll mention, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the funds perspective and in our investment process, we're constantly evolving. So when we started the fund in 2014, we were just really looking at the diverse leadership teams, board and executives, because that's what we could find. Mm -hmm. In 2019 is when we added in, like, do they disclose pay equity? Do they set those diversity goals and targets, et cetera, because more companies were disclosing them that we felt like it would be a fair judge, you know, like a, a fair thing to assess the companies on. Um, so that was, you know, one big kind of evolution of our, of our process. Um, I think, you know, the more we can get data from companies on those workplace policies, like we really wanna see that because we've been doing some interesting research um, looking back at the data that we've collected. So we have now eight years of data um, on, on the diversity at the, the top. And we have about three years of data on those other those other workplace metrics. Um, and what our, our one of our portfolio managers, who's like a quantitative analyst and just like loves getting into the weeds, you know, what she's what's been telling us is she's been looking back on this, um, you know, each kind of gender criteria as its own signal. So like women on the board or women CEO, women CFO, um, pay equity, diversity targets. And she told me that the strongest signal, the strongest gender criteria that's a signal of alpha is pay mm -hmm. equity. Mm -hmm. And that's not, you know, we don't disclose the weights in our score. It's our secret sauce, but um, that's not been a huge weight because we try to tie it back to the research um, that says, you know, like the diversity and leadership is really the, the, the strongest link to performance. But there is research when you have pay equity that you know, these companies perform um, better too for various reasons. And, and now we've seen that looking back at analyzing our own performance um, at that level that I think we'll start to uh, potentially like change some of the weights, you know, the weightings our portfolio, like saying like, okay, like that's a really strong signal. We want to invest more in, in those companies. So I mentioned they were about 53% of the companies that we own. So roughly the 200 out of the 400 that disclose that I could see our team evolving the score in that way to say, let's bump their weight up yeah. in our portfolio. Um, you know, so, so that's definitely a possibility. And, and we just want to continue to always um, evolve and, and reflect the information that we have um, in our process. So I think we'll do that. And then on the engagement side of things, um, a week ago, we launched a new engagement campaign that focused on employee health and wellness and this was really in response to the U.S. Supreme Court ruling on Dobbs. Um, we, it, it took us a minute to be totally honest with you guys here to say, how, what is our response to that, right? Um, we're an asset manager, but we feel strongly, <laughs> you know, um, about equality for all employees, um, yeah. including women, including access to reproductive health care. Um, et cetera. And so what we decided to do was do a, a, an initial campaign. So it just started. I have no results yet. Um, next time I talk to you guys, I will. Um, but we wrote to 165 companies in the Pax Elevate Fund. So basically all of the U.S. names um, or most of the U.S. names. Um, and we wanted to basically find out how they were, you know, how they were supporting policies for employees and their families. Um, 
which would include issues like, you know, access to paid time off, um, including parental leave, the opportunity to opt in or opt out of family planning and reproductive health care benefits, um, family friendly workplaces, including child care and elder care, access to emotional well being resources, including mental health resources. Um, so it was, you know, it wasn't just on the, the Dobbs decision, we, we were making it a little broader to just really see the support that they have their employees around health and wellness and well-being. Hmm, um, so we asked, yeah, we asked the management teams to kind of review their practices carefully in light of their support, um, you know, being kind of having this resilience among their employees um, and for their businesses at large. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on how that the dialogue proceeds from here. Um, but this was just one way through our engagement, you know, um, abilities that we could, you know, have a voice and see what, what companies are doing. Because I think we all saw the initial list of companies that kind of came out and said, we're going to pay for our employees to travel, mm -hmm. depending on where they're geographically located, um, all of that, which was amazing. And we were very happy to see, but we wanted to really like understand like what's, what kind of benefits do you have? Like, you know, mm -hmm. for your employees, like, let's not just be reactionary. Like, let's, let's see what's, what's really going on there. Good for you guys. Um, you know, it, it's it's nice to see not to get not to get political, but it, you know, I I wondered, you know, what can you guys do um, from the perspective of of gender equity to address or or mm -hmm. understand what the companies you're invested in are are doing in response to the Dodds decision. So interesting. I'm, I'm I know so it's going on your YouTube channel, so I got. <laughs> that's right you, gotta, you, gotta, I, you can't get political michael be careful about <laughs> compliance i know i know um uh oh so, sorry the idea just slipped out of my uh, out of my brain but i wanted to follow up on the on the pay equity data which i think is also incredibly powerful mm -hmm. um how how much are you guys um sharing that data because kind of the application of that data is is very broad i mean i think about um you know just um small companies and the community in general and how understanding the impact simply of pay equity um yeah it seems it seems very powerful to me so are you guys sharing any of that data or what are your what are your thoughts about kind of the future of thinking about that data or or the other thing is <clears throat> back to the partnering question, are you working with any other organizations or other um, entities to explore that further or or anything else? So I, I guess I'm kind of leading to the partnership question. Yeah, yeah. Equileap is, is one that I mentioned earlier that's, um, you know, kind of collecting this data and, and having conversations with companies on, on how to better report. So right now, where it stands is like, we're looking to see if companies are disclosing their pay equity like efforts and, and initiatives and, and if they are doing a, a pay equity assessment, you know, is it by a third party or are they doing it internally, like trying to see, you know, how, how they're operating. But to your point, it's incredibly complex mm -hmm. and it really varies depending on the size of the company, the type of the company. Um, and there's different ways you can do a pay equity assessment. So there's not just like one standard way, I think, as we know. So um, right now we're just looking at, are they disclosing? I think the next level that we're gonna, we're trying to get to is to um, evaluate if it's, if it's strong, if it's good, you know, not just you're doing it, you're not, it's kind of binary right now. Mm -hmm. um, Cause again, it's, we're limited with data, um, but, I think what our research team really wants to get to the heart of through all of these different, you know, kind of metrics and criteria that we're looking at is the culture of the company, right? Like you can have good policies, you know, uh, I tell the story of uh, a friend of mine that maybe I shouldn't say the name of the company, uh, <laughs> a large consulting firm in uh, Boston. And I said, you get, you get six months of maternity leave. And it was this guy. And he said, yeah, when men and women get six months. I go, that's amazing of parental leave. Um, and he just looked at me and goes, Kelly, that would be career suicide if I took that. And so wow. immediately I thought of, you know, like our research team to be like, how do we capture that? Right. Like, how do we understand that that company doesn't have a culture that supports a strong policy like that? So that right. culture piece is definitely, I think the next like wave of what we're all going to be 
trying to get our hands on and, and figure out. And there's, there's certain things like, um, even at impacts, you know, we get assessed all the time, like, cause we better be walking the walk if we're talking the talk. Right. And, um, I could tell in one of the uh, surveys that we were responding to, they asked us what our parental leave was, which is 16 weeks for men and women. Mm -hmm. Um, but then they, the next question was, what's the average number of weeks that women have taken versus men? Yeah. You're totally trying to get at that question, which is so good and so genius, I thought, um, to see, like, is it something that's supported for the men to take? Because that family leave is a huge piece of the puzzle to the McKinsey study and the, the workplace equity, because if women are the only people, you know, in the organization that are taking these break, these kind of career breaks, or mm -hmm. it's to take care of their family members or whatever it is, um, it's going to be very hard to make up for that, you know, like, because their male counterparts are, are just spending more time, they're getting more face time kind of moving ahead. And um, so I think that when family leave works, and men are taking it just like the women, it really evens the playing field. And I can speak from experience at my own company. Um, I just was on my, my second parental leave. And it was at the same time as two of my male colleagues on the same team, um, mm -hmm. who also took their full leave. And I remember thinking like, I'm really lucky that you guys have kind of done that too, because mm -hmm. otherwise I would have felt more behind the eight ball or maybe a little bit more pressure to come back early. Um, so it's been, the culture piece is, is really important. I think that's fantastic. And it, it makes me wonder, um, as we're getting to the last, um, you know, seven or eight minutes here, what resources you guys have that that you can share um, with us that we can share with with our investors and clients um but also what resources as as you again i'm I'm looking forward a little bit and wondering how you guys are thinking about um communicating some of these ideas and sharing some of this um this data um with um, kind of the broader community. How are you, how are you, it's, you know, so this is so important. All this information is so important. And I feel like more people need to know. And you guys are a great resource and can be a great resource. So let's start with, what do you have now that we can share with um, with folks? You talked about a uh, one paper that you had available. Do you have other resources that you can share with us that we can make available to um, to folks and then maybe get into the question, where do you, where do you see the, the information sharing moving forward? Yeah, we have a ton of, of great resources um, on our website. It's obviously kind of dense. So the ones that I would call out and I'm, I'm happy to share through you, Michael, with the rest um, of the group on the line is the business case for diversity. So that's that white paper. I think it's six pages. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not too long and it really goes into the weeds of like, here's how, here's how we're saying a company is more resilient through diversity. Here's how we're saying they have better, um, corporate culture, that they're more innovative, um, that they're more sustainable is actually another link. Um, you know, and, and here's the specific reports and data that supports that. So that's definitely one, um, especially for any like naysayers you might know that you just want to say, Hey, this is smart investing. That's mm -hmm. the piece I use all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece for probably everybody on this call who's invested in the Pax Elevate Fund is um, a kind of a short report. I think it's just a couple of pages, but it's called Beyond Financial Returns. Mm -hmm. um, of course, financial returns are important and Michael can talk to you all about that. Mm -hmm. um, that's his job. Um, but how are we moving the needle? You know, what... What are these stories from companies like the Walt Disney story that I mentioned, um, like the example of Etsy of why they're a global women's leadership fund? Like, why is that? Um, you know, we report, we have this kind of published quarterly. It gives a really nice overview of the strategy, but then it just talks about these specific, you know, engagements on pay equity, board diversity, racial equity. Um, it'll probably highlight two or three companies that we've, the story of the engagement, and then also um, some of the holdings in the fund of just kind of why the, why they're kind of in our fund. So beyond financial returns report is another one. And then our engagement report, if that's the piece that you're like super into, just from our firm, so not specific to the Pax Elevate Fund, but our firm publishes a really comprehensive engagement report that highlights the conversations that we've had with various companies not just on the um, 
you know, kind of equity and, and racial diversity and inclusion pieces, um, but also on like climate um, action and, and, and other areas of sustainability challenges that we're trying to um, engage companies on. So that's a little bit more comprehensive, but people love it because it has a ton of stories from the companies we're owning and, and kind of what happened after our dialogue with them. So those would be the three that I would call out. And then, um, I don't know, I think moving forward, we're saying what's our partnerships kind of look like or or where yeah, are we going to well, use the information more broadly? Yeah, so so first of all, let me just say that if, if, if um, Kelly will make those available yeah. to us and anybody that's on the call, if you'd, if you'd like a copy of any of those things, please let us know and we'll be happy to forward that um, on to you. Um, or if you have if you have folks that you want to share it with, um, don't hesitate to let us know, and and we'll be happy to to get that out. Um, yeah. So so moving forward, what I'm wondering about is maybe maybe let's let's talk about the partnership. And are there organizations that you guys are are aligning with or finding that you're working with um, to to help um, kind of move the needle to help um, with with some of this? You you talked about that data organization, but I wonder if there are other organizations that you find that you're um, that you're working with. And then the other the follow up question to that is is kind of moving forward. I know that um, that you guys are interested in um, putting out more uh, more information, more articles, and things like that. Where do you see that that going in terms of your ability to? spread the word to share more of these stories and and more of these important concepts um with the kind of the broader community the investing community and and beyond but um sorry i, I keep compounding my questions but are, let's start with with partnerships yeah well um you know partnering with people like you honestly michael you know like you're helping us get the word out because we're primarily working with financial advisors and institutions right mm -hmm. Um, so I think that we rely a lot on folks like yourself to spread the word with their clients. So we're typically not as often going to the end investor in one of our funds, but through an intermediary like yourself. Um, so we love doing conversations like this. I spend a lot of my time speaking at, at conferences, um, mostly industry conferences. So, mm -hmm. you know, like larger firms with financial advisors that I'm selling that business case too, because not as are, you know, well-versed as Michael on this topic and, and still need a little convincing. Um, so so, so let me, let me, let me yeah. ask you a question there. Sorry to interrupt you, but um, I know time is, time is a little short. I wonder, for example, if you ever spend time or if you would be open to spending time, um, you know, talking with or giving a presentation, maybe at a nonprofit that was focused on women's issues or, or other types of organizations, um, just trying to make connections and, and definitely. Kind of spread yeah, we, we do that all the time. Like I was yeah. just speaking at something for the Women's Foundation of Colorado, you know, mm -hmm. so there's um, a lot of a lot of reason to connect foundations and organizations, um, nonprofits with this type of investing, like the mission alignment is a big, um, a big topic for us. So mm -hmm. We're happy to, yeah, speak to any of those kind of audiences. I, I just think it totally resonates on a million levels. And those people are really engaged on something anyway. And they're trying to reflect, you know, their values and what they want to see in the world. And um, not everybody knows their investments are a piece of, you know, part of the puzzle. Um, so, yes, I would be happy to do that. That's great. Well, we are um, reaching the end of our time. It's gone fast. Um, it thank you, Kelly, so much for uh, for joining us today. I hope everybody got a better sense of um, of what the fund is all about. Got a better sense of what um, Impacts is all about, and um, and maybe feels a little bit better about the impact that their dollars are having, their investing dollars are having towards trying to move the needle on on gender equity um, in general. So. Thanks a million. Any any parting words or final thoughts you want to share? No, just thank you for for taking the time to to hear about this. You know, it's it's something we're really passionate about, and we are very happy and um, thrilled that you guys have the confidence in in us at asset managers to um, invest your money in this way. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. I, I appreciate it, I, and I encourage our uh, participants to join me next month. Larry Swedro is joining me, and we're going to be talking about. Um, 2022, what, what kind of the investing uh, economic uh, outlook 
um, looking back in the rearview mirror and looking ahead to 2023, what do we expect um, from the markets and from the economy moving forward? So that'll be next month. Thanks, everybody. We'll sign off and um, have a great week.